Welcome back everyone. So today we are going to be taking a little bit of a deeper dive into our exploration of Akkadian with an overview of nouns. Now understanding how nouns are formed and how they function syntactically and grammatically within a sentence is absolutely foundational to developing your translation abilities. It's a skill which you're going to need every single time you pick up a cuneiform tablet and want to find out what it has to say. So first things first, what are nouns? Nouns are naming words, so uh, they can refer to people, places, objects or ideas, things like temple, wisdom, uh, Babylon. Uh, it's usually pretty simple to spot a noun in English because they're preceded by a definite or an indefinite article, so words like the or a or an. Unfortunately, in Babylonian, uh, there are no definite or indefinite articles, so we spot nouns based on their grammatical content alone. Uh, so, in the formation of nouns, there are three things to consider. Gender, number and case. Most of uh, these ideas are probably very familiar to us already. So, as with many uh, European languages, Akkadian has masculine and feminine gender in the nouns, and this affects the, um, the grammatical content of their form. In terms of number, we have singular and plural, as you would expect, and we also have the dual number. The dual number is used to refer to two, uh, two things, or a pair of objects. Usually it's used to refer thing to things which form natural pairs, things like eyes, arms, legs, etc. And last but not least, we have case. The case system may be new to many of you, and the idea behind the case system is that nouns are inflected, they change their form to reflect their function in a sentence, not just the gender or the number of the noun. So let me show you what that means here. Akkadian has nominative, accusative, and genitive case. So, nominative is used to refer to the subject of a sentence, whilst the accusative is used to refer to the object, and the genitive is a marker of possession. So the best way to explain this in short term um, is by using an example phrase. So, I praise the statue of the god. In this example, I would be in the nominative, because it's the subject of the phrase. Uh, praise is the verb, for which the statue is the object. So the statue would go into the accusative state, whilst I would be in the nominative state. And then, seeing as the statue is of the god, i.e. this is a relationship marked by possession, the god would go into the genitive state. Another way of explaining the case system would be by using the example of pronouns. So if you understand pronouns such as I, you, he, she, it in the translation of a sentence, those words are going to be in the nominative as they're the, forming the natural subject of the sentence. If you see pronouns such as he, she, it, or them, these are the objects of a sentence and so will be reflecting the accusative state. And if you see phrases such as of him, belonging to her, etc., these are going to be nouns which are in the genitive state, marking possession. Another thing to note about the genitive is that the genitive state is triggered in nouns which are following a preposition. Prepositions are those little words which denote direction or the relationship between nouns, uh, words like towards, inside, away from, etc. Prepositions uh, trigger the genitive state in the following noun. Now we move on to how we form nouns in Akkadian. Now all words in Akkadian, adjectives, nouns, verbs, participles, are formed by uh, applying regular patterns to a three root consonant base. In Akkadian we mark the three root consonant base with a square root sign like this. This is used to show us that what, what is contained within the square root sign are the three root consonants of the word. Now, if we take a simple example in Akkadian, like the word for a cutting, um, if you were to look this up in a dictionary, you would find the word nixon, like this. Now, the root consonants of this word are n, k, 
and S. So all of our grammatical content is based on this ending here, the U and the M. We call this the case vowel and the mimation. The mimation is common in old Babylonian texts, however it falls out of use around 1500 BC. So if you're looking at standard Babylonian texts from the first millennium, it's quite likely that you'll see the word written without the mimation, just with a case vowel like that. Uh, the case vowel here, in this instance, is in the nominative form, and this is the standard lexical rendering for uh, nouns in the dictionary. Uh, so, we have our case vowel and our mimation here. Now, in order to form a noun in Akkadian, you will need to find the stem of the noun from the dictionary form. And this is easily done just by removing the case vowel and our mimation, and therefore all grammatical content from the noun. So you would end up with a stem which looks like this. And to form a noun, you would add on the respective case vowel and mimation according to the gender, number and case of the noun. So now it's time to introduce you to your first nominal paradigm in Akkadian. Uh, learning this paradigm is going to help you to be able to recognise whether a noun is in the nominative, accusative or genitive case as well as the gender of the noun, and whether it's in the singular, the plural, or the dual. Um, so first things to note are that the case vowels, which precede the mimation, or lack thereof in the case of the masculine plural, will have a different vowel for the nominative, accusative, and genitive. So for the nominative, it's the U, for the accusative, it's an A, and for the genitive, it's an I. And secondly, for the plural forms, the vowel is usually lengthened. In the case of the feminine plural, the A vowel is lengthened uh, for both the dual and the feminine plural. And thirdly, you can usually spot the feminine marker for a noun by this T consonant here. We call this the feminine T suffix. And last but not least, the dual doesn't have separate masculine and feminine forms. And it also ends with nonation as opposed to mination. So the final consonant of the dual form will be an N. So let's take an example of both a masculine and a feminine noun. Uh, the word in Akkadian for boat is a lepum. This is the dictionary form. So to find the stem of the noun, we're just going to remove the mimation and the case vowel. So we're left with this stem, a lep. And then onto the stem, we can add any of the masculine uh, endings. So if we wanted a plural, we would just add the lengthened u vowel to read boats. Or if we wanted it to be a genitive formation, denoting something like uh, belonging to the boat, we would add the genitive singular uh, ending in. And then in terms of feminine nouns, we find the stem of a feminine noun by removing the mination, the case vowel, and the feminine T suffix. So in the case of the word for goddess, which in Akkadian is eeltum, we find the stem by removing mination, case vowel, and the T suffix. And then onto this, we could add the feminine plural ending. So you'd have eelatum for goddesses, etc. Um, one more thing to note about nouns is that it's always important to recognise which gender your noun is uh, because this will affect the form of the adjectives, verbs, etc. which qualify it. So I have here on the board some example nouns in the cuneiform script so that you can learn how to spot the nominal endings when you're transliterating directly from Akkadian. For more on how to transliterate you can see the introduction to Akkadian video which I did. So, uh, starting from the top noun at the top here, uh, we would transliterate these signs, uh, li, this is the phonogram ib, followed by the sign for b. So, in the instance of this noun, we don't have the mimation, so it's quite likely that this would be a word uh, in the context of a first millennium text. So we are missing our mimation, but we do have the case vowel. Now, this case vowel is the I of the genitive. So this noun in context would be translated as the word for heart, and it is in the singular 
genitive masculine. Uh, second up, we have these two signs here, which will read e vim in transliteration. So this is the word for God, the nominative form is elam, and here we do have the mimation at the end, and this is the genitive masculine singular form for the word God, or in context would be translated something more like of the God. And the final word here is transliterated she, it, ra, and the final sign is am. So once again, we do have our mimation at the end here, and the case vowel is the a vowel of the accusative. So shipram would be the masculine nominative singular dictionary uh, form, and the word means task or work, but here we have masculine singular accusative form, shipram. Uh, sometimes if you see two vowels next to each other like this in transliteration, it could be indicating a long vowel. However, if we were to transcribe this in the context, um, a long vowel wouldn't add any meaning, it wouldn't make any grammatical sense. So we know that this is just a short vowel, shipram. And one final thing to note with regards to transliterating logograms into English is that plurality can be indicated by use of this logogram mesh at the end, um, as opposed to a phonetic rendering from the nominal plural form. So these two signs here, demu and mesh, mesh here is being used to indicate the plural form and it means in Babylonian mari, which is the word for sons. Uh, similarly with these signs here, uh, these are logograms representing uh, the word for demons, actually, in Akkadian. And um, once again, the plural form is being indicated by the logogram mesh as opposed to with the normal phonetic rendering. And the word for demons in Akkadian is gale, like that. And as always with language learning, there are exceptions to the rule, irregulars. The best examples of these in Akkadian are uh, nouns which are masculine in the singular, but feminine in the plural. Um, the example for this irregular is the word for house, beaten. So you can see it here in the nominative singular, and then in the plural it's gone to the feminine, it takes the feminine ending here. You can see the feminine T suffix after the lengthened A vowel. Uh, secondly, we have nouns which double their consonants in the plural, which is fun. So you have the word for father here, abum, and then in the plural it's doubled the B consonants here. Um, thirdly, there are some nouns which are grammatically feminine but lexically masculine. Uh, and then we also have nouns which are missing their feminine T suffix. So they're feminine nouns but the T suffix is missing, like the word for mother here, umum, and then the T suffix comes back in the plural, so it forms umartum. And last but not least, uh, we have biconsonantal roots. So it's important to note that not all nouns in Akkadian have three, uh, have a three root consonant base. Some nouns only have two roots, uh, two root consonants, and we call these biconsonantal. Uh, the most common example of this is the word for God, elum, and these nouns have an alternative plural form. They can use this alternative plural form. So uh, the paradigm for the alternative biconsonantal plural form is uh, this paradigm here, the nominative being ani, the accusative and genitive being ani with a lengthened i vowel at the end there. Now, in addition to the added complication of biconsonantal roots in Akkadian, Akkadian is also subject to a phenomena called weak roots. So, first of all, what is a weak root? In comparison to a strong root, uh, like for the verb to to split, P-R-S, a weak root will contain one or more of the following letters. It could be a glottal stop, the nasal N, the W or a Y. Now what this means in practical terms is that if, a, if any of the root consonants contain these letters, uh, sound changes will 
be undertaken in the formation of a noun. Sound changes in the form of secondary lengthening, assimilation, vowel elision, etc. So it's important to realise that a root can contain just one of these letters, uh, like with the noun for prince, we have R, B, and glottal stop is the final root letter, that's a weak root, or it can contain uh, multiple weak roots. So an example of a, of a root which has two weak uh, consonants is the verb to be able to, which contains two glottal stops at the end there. Or well, there's even triply weak roots, where all of the root consonants are weak consonants. As with this, this is the verb to speak, a womb. So, um, it's usually quite easy to spot a, a noun which has a weak root, because you'll see a contracted vowel where you would normally expect to see a consonant. Um, for example, a noun which has a third, third weak root is shadoom. This is the word for mountain. And you can see the circumflex accent here over the case vowel. This is indicating that at some time in the past there has been a contraction of two vowels here. So a, a sound change has occurred, and in this instance it's because of a third weak root. Um, the, the stem of this noun before the contraction occurred would have looked something a little bit, a bit like this, with your glottal stop at the end here which has disappeared and the two vowels have assimilated. And this brings us to our final section, which pertains to the sound changes which occur because of the presence of these weak root consonants. Now there are four main types of sound change which you will observe overall. These are contraction, vowel elision, secondary lengthening and assimilation. Now there are all sorts of sound change rules which govern uh, these outcomes and we'll uh, go into those in more detail in a follow-up lesson. But for now, we're just going to look at a noun whose third weak, uh, root consonant is a weak consonant. So you can see what the paradigm looks like. Uh, so that noun is going to be the word for prince, whose root consonants are R, B, and the third weak consonant is the glottal stop. Now, if you were to look up this form in a dictionary, you would see the form like this. And the case file will be contracted with uh, a circumflex accent like this. Now the stem of this vowel, before any of the historical assimilation took place, will be this. Ruba, and then you have your glottal stop at the end. I'm going to add the case vowel and my nation after the hyphen. So what happens when you try to add the case vowel and my nation to this historical stem is that the glottal stop, the weak root, is just going to disappear and leave the A vowel of the stem and the case vowel in the nominative U in contact. Now the sound change uh, which happens when a third weak root just disappears like that is called secondary lengthening. And all it means is that the vowel which precedes the weak root which has disappeared is going to turn from a short vowel into a long vowel, which we represent with a macron like that. So now we have our long A vowel of the stem and the U case vowel. Uh, Akkadian cannot tolerate two vowels like that, short and long, in close contact, so they're going to contract to form this U vowel with the um, circumflex at the top there. So the whole nominal paradigm is going to decline according to this thinking, and it will end up looking a little something like this. So we have Rubum. Uh, for our nominative, so it actually um, still retains the U case vowel, it's just got a circumflex to show that a contraction has taken place. Our accusative is Ruban, so we're still retaining our A vowel in this instance, and we have the circumflex over the A, and the genitive will look slightly different again. This time the I vowel has contracted with the lengthened A vowel to form E, E with a circumflex, so Ruben is now our genitive form. And the plurals will look something like this. We still have the U vowel, but it's contracted instead of lengthened. And for the accusative and genitive, we have Rube for our accusative and genitive plural forms. Uh, so, essentially, all that's happened is that our normal case vowels, U, A and I, have contracted with the lengthened stem vowel to form these contracted vowels here. 
Um, and I believe that that's enough information to take on for an introduction to Nam's and Acadian. I hope that you guys have found that useful and I will see you next time.